speaking of older people, twice on the way into the pulpit out in Indianapolis, I fell down. So now every time I stand up, the congregation, <gasps> that's the way it begins. Turn, if you have your books with you, please, turn, please, to um, uh, Genesis 24. And um, that gives you the setting for what I wanted to say here this morning, or what I believe the Lord would have said. Um, you get the picture very quickly. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. Um, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham sent unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Put, I pray thee, my, thy hand under my thigh. I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that thou, thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And uh, then skip over with me, please. Uh, we can't read the, the whole thing, um, but um, if you look over there um, in uh, verse 9, uh, verse 8, And the woman, what if the woman is not willing to follow? Then shall I be clear of this oath? And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear unto him concerning the matter. The servant took um, uh, ten camels, camels of his master, and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. He rose and went to Mesopotamia and to the city of Nahor. Of Nahor. And uh, he uh, came to the well, made the camels kneel down there in Nahor uh, w without the city by the well, the water, at the time of the evening when the time came that the women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. And um, verse 15, it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher on her shoulder, the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And um, then if you skip on over, please, to um, uh, 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 verse 27. And the old servant said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. I hope you notice there, I will call your attention to it, that he his first heart was to God, the Lord God of my master Abraham. That's where his heart turned to begin with. The Lord God of my master Abraham. And then second, it went back across to Abraham, who was his master, um, in order to get at the application or to those professors who are not old enough to be stricken in, and, and the other teachers from here um, who are sending out us students, all of us students, to find a wife for the son. Third, finally, his attention turns to himself. The Lord led me, being in the way, the Lord led me. I, being in the way, the Lord led me. So that's going to be a bit of an outline of what we're doing. I believe I, being in the way, the Lord led me. I didn't know how to do it. 
I didn't, even after all the years here at the seminary, I still didn't know how to do it. It had to be the Lord who would do it. Yeah, yeah he'd do it through me. He'd, he'd work in me and do it, but he said, I will build my church. And I, I want you to remember that no matter how much you do, I, it's me that's doing it through you. And um, I just keep getting in the way. Um, and he bumped me around and used me. The exact place, the exact time with the exact, exact people, Rebecca and her family in this case. In order to accomplish his will to provide a wife for Isaac, God taught me the meaning of these words the hard way. My mother died when I was three years old. And um, my dad loved me, and my mother loved me. They gave me dad's name, Roy. I was Roy Jr. for many, many years until dad died. They loved me. And my sister later on quit school in order to try to take care of me. She was in the 12th grade. 11th grade, I think it was. Uh, they loved me. I knew I was loved. They all loved me. But there were four others in our family. That was a big family. And my next oldest brother was, I think, seven or eight years older than I was. And I can still remember how I was always getting in the way of them. I can still remember them saying, Roy... Uh, we were clear out of the baby business, and then you were born. And we had to go find diapers and baby clothes and start all over again. And I can remember their saying to me, get out of my way. I've got to get this milk back to the cooler. I've got to get this uh, feed down to the chickens. And uh, Dad saw this taking place, and so he called his sister, who had been teaching school down here in Newcastle, yeah, in Newcastle for 25 years or so. And uh, she quit teaching school in order to come home and take care of this. It had been about four years old, take care of me, my Auntie May. And she poured her life into me. I knew all too well how to get in the way. And she showed me how to get into the way of the Lord by his word. One of the things she required was that I memorize the scriptures, not by the verse, <laughs> but by the whole chapter. It was a chapter at a time. Um, and uh, one of the chapters that she had me memorize was the one that would later save my life a few years later when I was in the South Pacific on an aircraft carrier. You know how those words go. The heavens declare the glory of God. We sang them. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day our speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What does God mean by that? That word line, the line of the stars, the sun, the moon. My aunt had taught me the words. Now, it was only about 12 years later that I was made the, moder the, the navigator on board that aircraft carrier, the Petroff Bay, CVE-80 in the South Pacific. And I was faced immediately with a serious problem, serious need. How can I provide a landing strip for those pilots who had been out on a mission in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, several hundred feet long it has to be. But uh, they had to know where it was or they'll drown when they come back from a mission. The Navy taught me to read or to hear the voice of the sun, the moon, and the stars. I had to know the name of the star, three things I had to know, the name of the star, I had to know the exact minute when I was taking this reading. And um, third, the exact angle between the ship that I was on 
in um, that star. And with those three pieces of information, the name of the star, the exact time, and the angle, there would be a line of position. That's what was called. That was the professional name for it, a line of position from that star right down to where I was on board that ship. And with the line of position from this one over here and from that one there, and where those three lines crossed, within a quarter of a mile in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, that's exactly where this aircraft carrier was. And um, <clears throat> those were God's words as he wrote them in Psalm 19 down to us. Their line, that's his word. He used the word. Uh, the Navy, that many years later, adopted the word. And, uh, still, where those three lines crossed on my chart, there on that carrier, was exactly where that uh, pilot, uh, where that ship was, so that our pilots would not have to drown after a hard mission. We had, um, one time after this, um, we had captured. Uh, two Japanese planes, and we're bringing them back to the United States to get some uh, to get some statistics on them, so our pilots would know what their planes would do or would not do. And I had been down below rummaging around in those planes, and discovered that they were using the same kind of instrument, and taking the same figures that we were using. And um, it occurred to me, if we could jam the stars, <laughs> they wouldn't have a chance. We jammed the radio, but God prohibited that. There is no speech nor language where their voice, voice the sun, moon, and stars, are not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Those words... It meant a lot to me when I was just a boy growing up because my aunt required me to memorize them. But they meant a lot more for me down there, still leading me. And uh, then 20 years later, fast forward, um, I being in the way, the Lord is still using me and leading me. Jesus had used us in the building of churches in Indianapolis uh, two churches there, and down in Columbus, and up in, uh, in uh, 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 Lafayette. And um, there were others that were being built. He had used us. Um, but then people began saying that it was our church. Our church is such and such. Or your church. Or their church. And worst of all, Roy's church. I said, I didn't do that. I don't know how to do that. It had to be Jesus. He said, I will build my church. He, he may use me to do something, but it's he who's doing the building. And they, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. And turn around a little bit later, and they're still saying it. <laughs> and so I came to the conclusion, finally, that I had to get out of there. And then they would know that it was Jesus was doing it. And so I proposed to resign from the congregation. And there were older elders, older than I was then. And uh, they had more wisdom than I had. And those elders said, Roy, don't resign. Just take a year's leave of absence, and then people will know that it's Jesus who's doing the work. And um, uh, Bill and Beth and Bob were um, uh, just ready to start college. And uh, Margie and I had seen many families who were not going to let you get out into that cold, old, sinful world. We're going to hold you here at home. And then we'd seen the other kind of couples that would say, how soon are you going to be gone? <laughs> and it occurred to us that there was another way to take them out into God's world and show them that no matter what country, what culture, what civilization, what language, we could show them that he would take care of them wherever they were. 
any place in his world. And so, when um, uh, that was 1974, and uh, Bill and Beth and Bob were just ready to leave for college, and um, I preached, uh, I took them, all of them, and uh, preached on um, uh, Jesus' words there out of John 16, 7. 16, 7. It is expedient for you that I go away. I preached that to the congregation that day. And we drove out of there. We drove out of town, east on in, on, of Indianapolis on I-70, and then up into Canada where we left the old car and flew across to Brussels and got a Volkswagen camper that was to be our home for the next 14 months. We found Jesus kept using us in his way as the American family. We camped out, and uh, we always sang together in worship. Margie could sing well. Uh, she kept me even on the tune. And, um, <laughs> And um, we, we love to sing as a family. And um, all over Europe, in pieces of historical, geographical, and Reformation importance, we took the family and showed them these places. The fact that uh, Bill is now a citizen, a dual citizenship, but he's a citizen of Scotland. And that uh, Beth is also a citizen of England. Uh, this is one indication if you, if you ever try to preach this, look out, it can come back to bite you. The families are over there, and my great-grandchildren <laughs> are over there in Oxford. I don't mean they're in school yet, but uh, my daughter, uh, my granddaughter is, uh, and, and uh, they were born over there. One other incident stands out in my mind as evidence that God was keeping us in his way in the exact place that he intended us to be at the exact minute that he intended us to be there for the exact person that he had already planned it. Bill and Beth that year had flown back to, to um, uh, the United States to um, go into college. And Margie and Bob and I, this one right here, were, um, were uh, uh, traveling, and um, we went down through Europe to Ankara, and um, I had uh, an appointment to speak there to the underground church. That's an interesting thing. It's an illegal church. They weren't, they weren't allowed to be legal, and um, uh, that was a thrilling experience. Hundreds of people in that group. They love Jesus Christ, and they're willing to sacrifice anything. And for him, the kingdom was very real and very dear to them. And uh, uh, three days of teaching of Christ's unlimited kingdom, that doctrine which is particularly close to the history and the theology of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, the unlimitedness of Christ's kingdom. That's what they were asking me to speak about. And um, we escaped from the police. Is that mine? We escaped from the police in Turkey and got crossed over into Syria. I wanted to see Syria. I, wanted, I had a particular reason for going there. I'd been there with uh, Harold Harrington and Bob Tweed years before that. And I wanted to see the mission that was there in Latakia or Latakia, whichever way you want to pronounce it. I wanted to see that, and um, the Turkish people were unhappy with me, and um, uh, uh, when we got, I expected to be stopped by them uh, at the border, but I discovered that they had found in my passport that I was listed as being a minister, and they had wrongly come to the conclusion that I was a minister of government. Well, I wasn't going to correct them on that subject at that instant anyway. <laughs> and so they let us get across into Latakia. And uh, we came to uh, 
Pawtucket at night. It had been raining, it was cold, and I didn't have a, a first idea about how to get down to the American School. That was the name of the church building where, where, to, where the ministry of the Reformed Presbyterian Church had centered there in Latake, and you could be praying for them. That name appears in the, the news from time to time now. They're still having problems there in, in Syria. And, um, and uh, I didn't know how to get down there. Went to this motel and said, do you have a boy who knows where the American school is? That's the way it was known, the church and the building, big, big building. And um, they said yes, and I said, well, uh, could he go down with it? Yeah, they put him right in the camper with us. And uh, as soon as we got in there, I gave him some money. That was a mistake. But um, um, uh, he, he took us down through in the night. It was dark by now. And uh, we pulled up in front of this big building, and he jumped out and ran away. And, and uh, I knew when I looked at it that it couldn't be the American school because the American school had huge trees all around it. And this one was completely cleared of all trees. But there wasn't anything else to do. It was night that way. I, I, I think I left Bob and Margie in the car, and I walked up towards the building, and um, there was barbed wire all the way around it. But I could see into the light on the first floor there, and it was full of soldiers, troops. And so I was just sure all the more that this wasn't the American school. But what else could I do? I went around to the back of it, and there was a stairway that went up to the third floor. It was a big building. And I, I got up the, and banged on the door. And a little girl came out. The minute the door opened, there was a searchlight that hit me in the eyes. And it had been on purpose. They wanted to know who was coming to that door at night. And uh, the searchlight hit me in the eyes, and all I could say to the little girl was, American school. And she screamed and ran back around the corner. And a minute later, another woman, and she had a dress on. I could tell she was a woman. And she still was blinded by that bright light. And, 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 and she stared at me for a minute. And then she screamed. And she said, Roy Blackwood, how did you get over here? And the minute she spoke, I knew her name. A D.B. Awad had been in school down here in a college called Geneva with Margie and myself when we were in school there. And uh, uh, mm. we went back out and got Margie and Roy and uh, Bob and uh, went in, and her old daddy, who had been the pastor there, was there. He'd been sick. And uh, the troops had come in and taken over that building, as they're doing in Syria yet today, that kind of thing. And um, they had they'd made them prisoners on the third floor. And he was very sick. And uh, D.B., cried. As she told us how lonely she had been and how she had been begging, begging God for someone, maybe someone from Geneva who knew her and who knew her father, who could be there. And uh, we showed up at the door in the middle of the night. And um, he was very sick. I think he died shortly after that. I think we were the last people to sing and pray with him. And um, um, I, being in the way, the Lord led me. Only God could have arranged that as he did there at that time. Um, I 
I don't know where Adibi is. I haven't been able to find out. There are people down in the, near the college who uh, knew her. Um, was she killed? I've heard that she's dead. Or did she die? I don't know. But I know that, uh, the joy that we had there together that night as we sang and prayed and then went on the next morning was a joy that only God could give. I being in the way, the Lord leads. And that's what he does for all of us. We being in the way, God led us. Um, from there, we went on down, and we were able to get in a Russian ship in Beirut and uh, go across to the island. I went to the consul and said, is there any way we could get across there? My friend Ken Smith had um, told me that um, um, Floyd and her family, Bob was going to be staying. Okay, thanks. They are signaling me time factor, <laughs> uh, that um, uh, that um, we needed to move on, and uh, we did find the Russian ship. The consul said there in Beirut, uh, I can't stop you, but there's no traffic over there now, and there's no place for you to stay over there. Well, we had friends that we had befriended from years before, and they had invited us to stay with them overnight or whenever we could come over, not just for a night, but for a time. And um, uh, the consul said, well, if you have your own provisions over there, then um, we can't stop you. You just have to go on over. If you get back, all right, will you come over and tell us what you see? We'd like to know. It was the if that uh, he sort of emphasized. <laughs> and uh, when we got over there, they were still fighting, but we did get in and out without being hit or hurt. And um, I could go on to tell you many, many, many stories more of um, down through the desert in Iran without any roads and how we were picked up by the pirates as we came out of Kuwait and uh, the captain of the little boat that we had the camper on, paid them off. And um, uh, then the soldiers rescued us on down a little further. And uh, we came back to, uh, we, went, uh, we shipped the camper back and uh, went down to, to Australia and met people there. And God blessed in the witness and ministry with them there. And then flew back across to pick up the camper in Southern California and came driving into Indianapolis on I-70 from the West. It really is round. <laughs> Takes a little more evidence for some people than for others. <laughs> but he says, I'm going to teach you anyway. I'm going to teach you anyway. And that's why we sang that psalm. The Lord brought Zion's exiles back. We sang that psalm the day we got back to Indianapolis with the congregation. The Lord brought Zion's exiles back. We were as men that dreamed. Our tongue was filled with melody. Our, uh, our, our mouth with laughter teemed. The Lord has done great things for us. And we rejoice in him. And um, we married Jack and Karen Baumgartner and then headed on east the very next day and got back at the old farm just in time to talk to my father before he died. That's you. First, the Lord is doing it all. 
And uh, to you, professors and elders and others here at the seminary, the Lord is doing it all. And uh, they are sending us as students. I'm still a student from here and always will be. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, they're sending you out into Christ's world uh, to find a wife for his son. That God would use you in that. To us as the messengers whom he guides us on the way, his way. To be right with the per person and people that God intends you to be meeting with in his saving of his souls, in his building of his churches. Just as he had left, just as he has guided us, that old servant of Abraham's. I, being in the way, you must get into his way, and his word will put you into his way. I, being in the way, the Lord led me. Would you remember that in the years ahead when things get tough? You wonder why I'm here? Well, not only these godly men and faculty and the staff here at the seminary have sent you. Jesus has caused them to send you. And now he's putting you right in touch with the very souls that he intends you to work with. In your building, he's using you. He's doing the building. I will build my church. He's using you to do it, though. I, being in the way, the Lord led me. God commands your blessing on every one of these servants, these students, pastors to be, for the years ahead, as you use them, put them exactly where you want them to be, at the exact instant you want them to be there, with the exact person that you want them to work with, in order that that person could become a member of his church. God, we pray that you would keep blessing each student here to that end. In Jesus' name, we pray it all. Amen. Amen.